This time on CarCraft Video, we are back on our 67 Mustang. The first episode, we did the suspension. We rebuilt the front and rear suspension using parts from Heights. This time around, we are doing the drivetrain. We've got a 351 Windsor and a T5 five-speed ready to go into our car. But first, Kevin and I are gonna check out some Mustangs on the Hot Rod Power Tour. Hot Rod Power Tour, day two, Nashville, Tennessee. It's awesome and it's hot. We're gonna check out some of the amazing cars that are hopefully making the long haul. Hot Rod Power Tour is a week-long road trip that we've been doing since 1995. It started as a cross-country road trip from Los Angeles to Norwalk, Ohio, to the Hot Rod Summer Nationals. We generally get somewhere between 3,000 to 5,000 cars. This year is a, a pretty big car count. We're probably around 5,000 cars. And you can imagine a whole line of muscle cars pulling through a small town USA. That's what Power Tour is all about, getting people out together, enjoying their cars with like-minded enthusiasts. Since we're doing a Mustang, yeah. let's go find some Mustangs. Here we are with the 65 Mustang Fastback and sort of this inspiration of our build. So what we're looking at here, we've got the, all the bracing under the hood. And all that stuff has gone away on our car. We don't have the shock towers anymore. We don't have the export bars. We don't have the Monte Carlo bracing. It's kind of cool to see how much more room we have under the hood of our car versus this car. Tour is about getting them out of the garage and driving them, and this guy has done that. It's a nice car. While we're looking for inspiration for our car, I'm going to take some from this. We're almost at the end of our time here in Nashville and day two of the Hot Rod Power Tour. There's a ton of stuff to see. New cars, old cars, handmade cars, jalopies. I don't know about you, Kevin. I can't wait to get back into the shop and get working on our Mustang. Well, we are back from the Power Tour and we are back here working on the 67 Mustang Coupe. And Kevin, this thing looks great under the hood. Thanks, spent a little time doing a super clean on all of the metal, replaced some of the seam sealers that were all crusty from the factory, blew apart the suspension and finished up any welds that we had maybe missed during mock-up, got a good epoxy primer on it, and a good single stage flat black paint that looks exactly like what Ford used in the 60s. Well, the next step now is to get our engine prepped. We have some work to do, uh, get the oil pan back on, clean it up a little bit, and then it'll be going right back in the car. The Windsor has a taller deck height than a typical small block. So we gotta get creative in dropping this thing in with a conversion pan and things like that, but it's worth it for the extra bit of displacement we're gonna get. We got the oil pan in place and it fits. It clears the steering rack and steering lines. This engine originally had a front sump oil pan on it. This is a low profile dual sump and it clears everything, so that's great. And it sits in here low enough that the stock air cleaner will fit under the hood. So the next step is to get the engine back out, put the oil pan on permanently, and then we're gonna put the transmission in the back of the engine and get everything reinstalled. While we've got the engine out, we'll go ahead and put in our E3 spark plugs with Diamond Fire technology. These plugs and wires will help our engine run cleaner and burn better.
So this is our complete EFI fuel tank conversion kit from Holly. Comes with everything in the box, including a sending unit, a 255 LPH pump, which is plenty of fuel to feed our sniper system, and everything you need to hook it up. It really makes it simple. And the thing I like about it is that I don't have to drill into a fuel tank and think about leaks afterwards. This is gonna drop right in the same hole. Now normally when you convert to EFI, there's different requirements for the engine for fuel. You need about 7 PSI for a carburetor, you need about 50 for a fuel injected system. So you have to upgrade your whole fuel system. The pump that comes in the kit from Holly will easily get us to 58 PSI, which is what the sniper needs. Now with the fuel tank installed and everything configured, now we can run our fuel lines. Fuel injection needs a send and a return line, and obviously the stock tiny little 516 line is not going to provide enough fuel for this engine or for the fuel injection system on it. We're using these VaporGuard push-on style fittings that are backed up by a clamp. The only other thing to really remember is that you need to make sure and route your fuel line safely underneath the car, away from things that move or spin, and to keep it away from exhaust components that are gonna heat it up. It's fairly straightforward. We're gonna plumb it out the side and just work our way up the car until we find the engine. When we got the car, there was no keys. So I had to go back in, pull the back seat, come in with the flashlight and the extension handle. When I popped the trunk, guess what's sitting on top of the gas tank? It's a world-class T5 transmission out of a turbo Thunderbird. Somebody that had this car had that idea already, but it just, the story told itself, you can't invent it. And uh, to me, I'm just so excited about it because it just organically fell into our laps. To put that T5 behind our 351 Windsor, we got an install kit from Holly. It comes with a Lakewood bell housing, all the fasteners you're gonna need, a hydraulic throwout bearing conversion, which is really cool. And while we're at it, we decided to upgrade to a spec stage two clutch with Kevlar friction material and an upgraded pressure plate. Stronger diaphragm spring for improved clamping force and an SFI approved flywheel. These old Mustangs had a mechanical clutch linkage with a basically a push rod from the clutch pedal to a Z bar to a clutch fork that went through the bell housing and actuated the throw out bearing on the front of the transmission. This uh, kit from Holly comes with a hydraulic throw out bearing that replaces all the mechanical stuff. And before we install all this stuff together, we're gonna need to determine the correct distance between the throw out bearing and the diaphragm spring on the pressure plate. Some throw out bearings are designed to turn the entire time that the engine's running. They're basically in contact with the pressure plate the entire time the car's running. These ones are not. There's supposed to be an air gap in between. And we'll use these spacers to set that distance.
So now with the engine and transmission mocked up into place, now we can put our Sniper EFI throttle body here in the place of the carburetor. This is by far the easiest way to get fuel injection on an engine that initially came with a carburetor. There's still a little bit of plumbing to do. We got to plumb in a fuel pressure regulator, but the Sniper gives us optional inlet ports. We're just going to come here straight off the back into our regulator and our send and return lines are right here. This is perfect. All we got to do is follow the instructions. But one of the cool things that happens in something like this, when it's all sort of meant to be, is the shifter comes out the factory shifter hole perfectly. It's awesome. While Kevin's running the plumbing for our fuel system, I'm about to put the new starter in. Uh, our engine didn't have a starter, so we went to a local AutoZone, found this here. This is for basically any 302, 351 Windsor from the 60s till they stopped making them in trucks in the 90s. The good thing about factory parts is that you can get replacements just about anywhere. So if we're on the road with our Mustang and something like the water pump fails, we need a voltage regulator, find it at our local AutoZone. A company like Holly Performance has a swap kit for this. It makes it really simple and everything's balanced, everything's in the box, so you really don't have to science anything out. It makes a conversion to EFI in a vintage car very simple. All right, ready? <laughs> Popping. At this point, we're really not sure what exactly is wrong with the motor. There's lots of things that are right, but something is still missing. We're not exactly sure what's going wrong. I learned that I like it when a f engine family keeps the same firing order throughout all of its iterations. So like small block Chevy and the big block Chevy are all 18436572. And um, with the Fords you had, and I knew this going into it, um, you had two different firing orders. Uh, we basically defaulted to, well, this is a 351, let's do the 351 firing order. It turned out that wasn't correct. And the way we figured it out was we took out the spark plugs for the cylinders that were discrepancy, the discrepancy between the two different firing orders. And then just cranked the engine by hand, stuck your finger over the spark plug holes and figured out which ones are coming up next. And that doing that process led us to, oh, this is the old 302 firing order. Move that over one, that's two. Five, which is this one. One other part of the learning experience is that you can't trust everything you read online. That's five again. See, there's two fives. <laughs> it's a nine cylinder. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. And one of the sites we went to to look up the firing order for a 302 had nine cylinders with the number five repeated twice. So <laughs> obviously that's not right. Uh, we did find the correct information on hotrod.com, by the way. And then chasing down um, fuel pressure, routing, um, just eliminating things 101. It's hot rodding 101, which is kind of the fun part, but it's also pretty stressful. In the process, everybody in the shop lent a hand trying to figure out what was wrong. And what we finally determined was we didn't have enough fuel pressure, so we, we figured that out, set it at 58 PSI. And then the last issue we had 11, was nine. we had 12 volts to the coil while it was cranking, but zero volts with the key and run. It, goes, it went to zero, so obviously the car won't continue to run with zero volts. And it's such a cool feeling to have this engine running. We roll the dice, it's a used engine from somebody that said it ran, but it does, it runs great. Overall, I think this is a great learning experience. These are the kind of things that happen when you start with something you don't know a lot about, uh, i.e. a used engine. And so we've, we figured it out, just sort of like trial by error, you go back to the basics. There's a lot to do still. We've got a ton of work to do to make it into a car, but at least it's talking to itself now.